giant worms, pirates and people who live in cemeteries. Let's find out more from Simon Reeve and his team. We're on a journey across the Philippines. We're travelling from the ancient rice terraces in the northern mountains on to the steamy, crowded capital city Manila and then on to the exotic southern islands. The Philippines is made up of more than 7,000 islands, packed with dramatic natural beauty. We'll be travelling through a country full of ancient mystery and 21st century instability. We'll encounter simmering conflict, religious fervour and political scandal. They found no skeletons in my closet. They found beautiful shoes. I'll be joined on the journey by Shea Rhodes, and catch your Adler. I've been investigating the macabre side of Manila's population explosion. If you live amongst the dead, I suppose, why not? It's just another normal thing to do, like going to the office. I've been with one of the Philippines' most exotic cultures as they dive for delicacies. I'm quite keen to get in the water and see if I can find any. Welcome to the Philippines. The Philippines is a rugged, tropical country, battered by earthquakes and typhoons, with a huge variety of landscapes. This sprawling archipelago of islands is clustered in the South China Sea on the Pacific Rim of Asia. We start our trip in the mountainous north of the country, a spectacular region and home to an ancient indigenous culture. We're bumping along on a mountain track and we're on our way to see what some people call the eighth wonder of the world. These are the rice terraces of Banawi. More than 2,000 years ago, the indigenous Ifugao people started building stone walls around the mountains using simple handmade tools it was an engineering project to rival the great pyramids of Egypt. But unlike the ancient Egyptians, the Ifugao didn't use slave labor. Working together, they eventually created 12,000 miles of terraces that are still worked by their descendants today. A complex irrigation system creates ideal growing conditions, and the rice that grows here is delicately flavoured and highly prized. You coming in? I met up with Beng Bimoya, a local guide whose family are Ifugao, to find out how this ancient way of life is adapting to the 21st century. Whoa! <laughs> Careful! Whoa! Yay! <laughs> so tell us, tell us about what makes this rice so special it's actually traditional rice been planted for centuries and the Ifugaos believe that it's given to them by Maknongan the Ifugao god for them to plant it was the gift of the gods yes and the rice of the gods what makes this rice special well because it's um, organic you know no synthetic fertilizers, insecticides, or whatsoever. I mean, we all eat rice, but where is the rice in this plant? Where does it grow? There's a, there you go. There's a bit of rice. Thank you. <laughs> it's almost a, a, a seed at the root. That is what it's all about. This entire area has been declared a World Heritage Site, but the rice terraces are now under threat. The farmers whose families have tended the paddy fields for generations are being confronted 
by a slippery, writhing menace. So which are your uh, rice terraces here? Yeah, all of this uh, you could see here up to that uh, area down there. The one with the straight dike. So what are the main threats to the rice terraces? Yeah, one of the main threats is uh, the presence of uh, earthworms uh, in the rice terraces. Here's some you caught yeah. earlier. And uh, good God! It's, uh, this it's is like what they call the, the giant earthworm. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine finding that in your garden or your, your allotment. Yeah, I have seen some. 17 uh, inches long. Why are they such a problem? What do they do? Uh, it bore holes in the walls and then later on the, the whole wall will, uh, will collapse. Millions of these monster worms have been driven into the terraces because the forests where they live are being destroyed. And you can see the bank is, yeah. is collapsing there as well. Up to a quarter of the rice terraces have now suffered worm damage and the young Ifugao are not exactly flocking to help with repairs. Your family have been here for generations. If you look to the future, are you optimistic about the future of the rice terraces or are you, um, are you concerned? Yeah, the younger generations do not want to work in the rice terraces. What do your own children want to do? They wanted to work uh, outside in the cities and uh, maybe earn more than what is being earned in the rice paddies. Does it sadden you? That, does it make you upset that they don't want to, yeah, to work here? Yeah, actually it saddened me because when they were young I've been uh, bringing them here so that uh, they could see the activities here. But uh, at of this moment uh, they do not want already to come and work in the rice terraces. The Ifugao should be doing okay because they can charge a premium rate for their rice and because the beautiful rice terraces here attract visitors from all around the world. So it's ironic and rather tragic really that perhaps the greatest threat to both the terraces and their way of life is the fact that youngsters here, like youngsters around the world, don't want to stay here working in the fields. They want to head to the cities. They want to head to Manila. And that's where we're heading to. South for the capital. of the population of the entire country. More than 60% live below the poverty line. As capital cities go, this one's grimy and completely packed. Manila just keeps on growing. The population density here is already the highest of any major city anywhere in the world. And new arrivals just keep turning up here from the countryside. The result is that people have to take drastic steps to find a home. Katia Adler has been to visit one of Manila's most curious communities in a rather chilling location. On a typical Manila morning, cacophonous and chaotic, I set off in search of a place where some of the thousands of Filipinos who flood into the capital in search of a better life apparently end up. I love graveyards. Whether I'm looking for a sense of history or just a place of quiet contemplation. It's different here though, I've heard. In Manila's northern cemetery, I've been told it's as much about the living as the dead. In and amongst the cold stone memorials to some of Manila's wealthier inhabitants, 
you start to notice life. Lots of life. Poverty and population pressures mean thousands of people have made their homes amongst the tombs of the North Cemetery. This street is called Neil Street. Okay. Yes. And is this where your house is? Yeah. Can you show me? Oh, yes, of course. Here on Main Street is the mausoleum for the well-off Gonzaga family. Mercy and her mum have looked after it for nearly 40 years. The Gonzaga family, what, what do you know about them? Well, who are they? They're rich. They're into garments and they have a factory. What do they think of you sleeping? You know, this is your, your bed, your, your television, pictures of your family. So what, what do they think of that? It was them who asked us to live here. They asked us to stay here because they knew we didn't have a home. Okay. So that meant, Mercy, that you were, you were born here. And what was that like as a little girl? Little children are scared of ghosts and, and the dark. Weren't you scared? Not at all, because I haven't seen anything with my own eyes. And I don't believe anything unless I see it with my own eyes. Mercy and her mum are well-established graveyard dwellers. But new families arrive here every day. Since people first began to settle here in the 1950s, the population has grown to an estimated 10,000. This is the reality of Manila's social hierarchy. The closest these families will get to the comfort of a middle-class life is tending to the middle-class dead. So basically, to live in this graveyard, someone in the family's got to earn their keep. Now, that could mean looking after one of these mausoleums or something a little bit earthier. Each weekend sees up to 100 burials. But the North Cemetery is not just the final resting place for Manila's well-off. The poor are here too. Look here how the graves are so packed together. It's quite different from those huge mausoleums. Families of poorer Filipinos bury their relatives in these cubicles, stacked up high, one on top of the other. An initial payment buys you just five years here, not exactly an eternal rest. Once the five years is up, you have to pay again. If you miss the payment, there's only one result. How do you feel about doing this, this work? I don't feel anything. Nothing. I've been doing this since I was eight years old. I learnt it from my mother and father. I suppose this really goes to show in the graveyard, doesn't it? If you live amongst the dead, I suppose, why not? It's just another normal thing to do, like going to the office, I guess. With its matter-of-fact attitude to death, this cemetery isn't a place for the squeamish. There's little room for sentimentality amidst this kind of poverty. But there's no mistaking the vibrant sense of community here. Wow, look at that. That is literally living on top of the graves. Most of the people arrive here from the countryside, pretty much penniless. There's little sanitation and life is hard. But over generations, a kind of village spirit has evolved with schools, shops, and a social order that's hard to find in the shanty towns scattered across Manila.
Religion and faith seem to dominate almost every aspect of life in the Philippines. This is supposed to be a, uh, a religious festival, but it feels to me as though the crowd here are on their way to a football match. This is one of the biggest religious festivals in the country, the procession of the Black Nazarene. religious piety here. The Philippines is uh, a very unusual country because it's a Catholic country in Asia. It's a Catholic country amid a sea of Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims. So it's almost unique in that sense. The Black Nazarene is a dark wood statue of Christ carrying the cross that came to Manila from Mexico in the 17th century. It's become a potent icon, said to have miraculous powers. Each year, the Black Nazarene is carried through the streets of the city, and en route, nearly two million people try to touch it. In previous years, people have actually died in the brutal crush. When the statue eventually makes it through the throng to the Quiapo church, it's met with an almighty surge of devotion. If there's one group that exercises as much power over ordinary Filipinos as Catholic priests, it's the country's politicians. Since independence from Spain and then the US in 1946, the Philippines has been led by an array of controversial and colorful characters. We've come to the fort area. It feels about a million miles away from the slums of this city. And we've come to meet a living legend, Melda Marcos. For 20 years, Ferdinand Marcos was president of the Philippines. And alongside him was his formidable wife, Imelda. Part glamorous assistant, part mother of the nation, occasional government minister, and constant presidential companion. Their grip on the country was absolute. For 14 years, the nation lived under martial law and thousands suffered human rights abuses. But in 1986, fed up Filipinos threw them out. They fled the country, leaving behind a strong whiff of corruption and a closet full of shoes. It feels a little bit like walking into the lion's den. <laughs> the lion might be elderly and a little bit fragile, She's still a lion. Come in. Thank you. Wow. How was it? An extraordinary room. I feel rather underdressed. Emelda Marcos's living room is beyond plush, and you instantly appreciate why her name has become a byword for extravagance. It's made out of pearls. The whole room drips with lavish indulgence. Well, most of it. And of course, many Filipinos accuse her of accumulating this collection with their money. I was hoping to talk to Madame Imelda about her love of all things lovely and how she acquired them. You have just extraordinary treasures just in this room alone. Could you talk us through some of the paintings? What, who, who's the... Uh... The Madonna. 
The Madonna is who's that artist? That is a Michelangelo Madonna. This is a Michelangelo. Michelangelo Madonna. And and this one? That's a Pizarro. Pizarro. And then over here, this is a Picasso. Picasso. Yeah. This is a Gauguin. It's a Gauguin. Yeah. How did you manage to get so many extraordinary, lovely things? Well, my husband was a uh, the lawyer of uh, gold mines and uh, also a gold trader. And he loved gold so much. He would always tell me, sweetheart, he said, it's hard to earn money uh -huh. honestly and properly but harder still to spend money properly. You be the one to spend. And then I said, why? And then he said to me, because all you buy is beauty. It sounds like a, a perfect relationship then. He, he earned the money. Yes. And you spent it. Spent it, right. And I just did not leave it in gold. I bought paintings, beautiful jewelry, beautiful silver, anything beautiful. But when, when President Marcos was uh, acquiring all this money and giving it to you to spend, did you think it was his money or did you look on it as money, the money of the Philippines, of the Philippines people? Oh no, I knew it was his money because I saw this gold already in his home. You were rich even before you became... He was rich. ...leaders of the country. He was rich, oh definitely. And that has always been Imelda's line. Thank you. Her husband, Ferdinand Marcos, was a staggeringly successful investor in gold who made billions. We didn't use the Filipino treasury as our own personal cash machine. And if you think we did, prove it. And so far, despite hundreds of court cases, no one really has. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your shoes. They found no skeletons in my closet. They found beautiful shoes made in the Philippines. <laughs> Imelda is back, loud, proud, and beautifully shod. And she does appear to be genuinely popular with some Filipinos. The Philippines government has seized more than 400 million pounds from accounts in Switzerland. But the puzzle of her remaining riches is locked up in bewildering legal cases and contested documents. Let's look at this. This is only so this one. is an envelope with Belgium on the front of it. The mysteries. What could this be? So this is some sort of treasury certificate. It's a slightly fuzzy... <laughs> no, you don't anymore because this oh. is dangerous already. <laughs> no way. Look. If only I had a photographic memory, I could tell you what it was. Yeah, but well, it's... Well, no, Alright, we can't show you. <laughs> But it shows deposits in the name of Ferdinand Marcos in a bank in Brussels, and it's for nine. It's for nine hundred and eighty-seven billion dollars. Nine hundred. Can we show the camera? No, please. Now, such a huge sum surely can't be genuine. But with Imelda, who knows? Like armies of lawyers, I failed to unravel the mystery of Imelda's billions. This is shallow waters. But I did get a very interesting and very long presentation on her plans to end poverty and build a tunnel through the Philippines that would solve the world's trade problems. Well, I feel I've been completely steamrolled by the grandmother of bling. It was quite an experience. I suppose in a way, all the allegations about her shoes have helped to detract attention from the really more serious accusations that have been levelled against her, the human rights abuses, the corruption, the theft of public money. And now it's a you've got a situation where Imelda is basically making a comeback. And tragically, the human rights abuses of the Marcos years seem to have made a comeback too.
In recent years, the Philippines government has come under attack for its human rights record. There have been hundreds of political killings and hundreds more abductions. This is a, uh, a page from an Amnesty International report that talks about uh, enforced disappearances. And it mentions uh, a few countries, but particularly Algeria and Chad, which are known human rights black spots, and the Philippines as well. Many of the killings are connected to a war fought between government soldiers and communist rebels called the New People's Army. Their 40-year insurgency has cost more than 40,000 lives. While battling the communist rebels, the Philippines Army has been accused of killing and torturing innocent left-wing activists, human rights workers and students. One retired army general has become notorious for his alleged role in these abuses. His name is Javito Pauperan. I headed for his office on the outskirts of Manila. I'm a bit apprehensive about meeting him. Not only is he known as the butcher, but he's also even more ominously known as the executioner. You've got this magazine cover here. This has been given to you as a happy birthday present, hasn't it? Yeah, it says, says an inquiry magazine, yeah. The general dubbed the butcher claims conscience is the least of his concerns. Are you ashamed of being known as the butcher? Initially, but uh, I have to... Uh, I have to live with that. This, this is war. How do you account for the fact that dozens of activists, of political activists and human, right work, human rights workers, disappeared or were executed in the areas under which you were in military command? There were no... Uh, uh, Incidents uh, were in deep to prove that I was involved, or my men are involved, or involved. None of this. But uh, in this kind of war, uh, to me, it seems to be that these are necessary incidents, meaning it got to happen. But killing human rights workers, students, no, young activists, you're saying that's 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 part of the war. Well, uh, they are going into uh, cover of being just human rights advocates. But in fact, they are very much involved in fighting. They just go back and forth, you know. The Supreme Court in the Philippines says that your participation in an abduction was established. And that's, that's according to them. But that's pretty definitive, isn't it? Just definitive, but uh, yeah, according to them. But it's more of... Uh, more of deduction, more of a presumption out of the alleged evidence and witnesses that we have, but still not a fact. The uh, communist rebels have uh, vowed to get you personally. They've said you're a dead man walking. Okay. <laughs> it's a threat. Do you think they're going to get you? No, it's nothing. It's nothing as a threat. They are not that good, really. It's just hype, you know, media hype or propaganda. What seems to have happened here to me is that there's been a really nasty, dirty war with atrocities committed on both sides. It's the sort of thing that we used to hear a lot about during the Cold War, and yet here in the Philippines, it's still going on. It was time to leave the urban chaos of Manila and explore a very different side to the country. We headed south to visit some of the thousands of islands that make up the Philippines. Shea Rhodes has been to a lush tropical island in the west of the country to learn more about one of the Philippines' most striking cultures. Shea Rhodes has been to a lush tropical island in the west of the country to learn more about one of the Philippines' most striking cultures. 
I'm here in Palawan, which is one of the islands that Filipinas are most proud of. And it's understandable, really. It's got beautiful beaches, pristine coves, some of the most stunning natural wonders in the world. But I'm going to meet an ancient culture, a group of people who are torn between honouring their traditional way of life and the pressures of living on an island that's fast becoming an eco-tourist paradise. It's early morning and I'm just off the coast of Palawan Island. I'm following a boat which is full of bajau, they're sea gypsies and they live and work in the seas around this area. They're taking us far out to one of their favourite fishing spots. And as you can see, fishing for these people really is a family business. For centuries, the Bajau have lived like this. Their colourful boats cutting through the seas around the islands of the Philippines as they fish for what they need to eat and maybe a little to sell. The whole family is completely at home on the ocean. It's a romantic scene. And their name, the Sea Gypsies, conjures up alluring images of freedom and simplicity. But the Bajau are a very old culture, facing some very modern challenges. The Bajau have a settlement on the edge of Palawan's capital, Puerto Princesa. Nasuria? Yes, you can Don't go. people fall in all the time? Yeah. Nasuria grew up here and she's a school teacher. It's because really? it's there the traditional way. So children learn to walk? Yeah. On these, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't yet. So. Yeah. They prefer to live under the water than the, than the land. They urinate in the water and everything they, do, they will do it from the water. They wash, they, yeah. That's why they cannot live in the land. How do they make their houses? Where do, where do they get all these the different materials? They, some of the, the materials they buy from the, from the market and some of them they are just picked from the, just like deer. When they see this, it's still enough for them to, to make a house, they just pick and put two picks in their house. For centuries, the Bajau roamed the ocean south of here. But ten years ago, war and piracy forced them to settle in Puerto Princesa. But even here, they live a precarious existence. This last shack standing shows how fragile the Bajau culture is. But it's not just the weather that threatens them. The local council are advertising Palawan as a clean, eco-friendly tourist destination. They want to move the Bajau out and build a pretty promenade here. And it's easy to see why. All this plastic, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't degrade, it, it's just going to stay. This yeah, is, this that's is a the reason why the city wants all the, the people here want to remove from this place. They put in the other place so that this one will be tourism area for them to make a beautiful city. And in a city where they're attempting to promote sustainability and ecotourism, yeah. you can see why. Yeah. Traditionally, the Bajau would throw their natural materials like wood and reeds into the sea under their feet. But do that with plastic and you end up with an unhygienic eyesore. That's why the city wants to move them to concrete housing inland. But can a sea gypsy live on the land? I caught up with the family who took me fishing to ask them if they could change their way of life. When you're on the water, can you tell me how, how does it feel for you? Do you feel connected with the sea? We're much happier living on the sea than living on the land. It's better to stay here rather than go to the land. The world around you change, is changing a lot. Do you think your children and your grandchildren will be able to continue the same way of life? 
Our children and grandchildren can survive in this life. Even with the storm and this crisis and everything, we're positive that they will survive. I feel like the timing of my visit has been really quite revealing. Just a few days before I arrived here, a typhoon swept through this community and destroyed half of it. And it seems to me that in many ways, the expectations of modernity, the expectations of the Palawenos who live with them, and the tourists who come to this island are at risk of doing exactly the same and sweeping away this ancient culture. From Palawan, we traveled south and east to learn more about one of the biggest issues facing the islands of the Philippines. These odd geological formations are known as the Chocolate Hills of Bohol, so called because when the vegetation turns brown, they look like little chocolate puddings. The Philippines has an extraordinary abundance of natural beauty, but there's a problem. This country has the highest density of unique and endangered species of any country in the world. And the rate of forest loss here has been faster and more severe than anywhere else on the planet. So the result is an environmental catastrophe, not just for the Philippines, but for all of us. This deforestation is a threat to many species of all shapes and sizes across the Philippines and here in Bohol. Among the animals that threatened by deforestation and habitat loss here in the Philippines is the poster boy or girl of wildlife in this country, the mysterious Tarsia. And I've come here to try and find some. Lito Pizarres runs a sanctuary for these elusive creatures, nocturnal primates that are solitary, silent bug eaters whose eyes are bigger than their brain. Oh, okay. oh. You spotted one? Yes. Oh, wow! Very small little thing. Ball of fur clinging to a branch. This is uh, like a bat, and the tail is like a rat. <laughs> Tell us how you started getting involved with uh -huh. Tarsius. When I was a uh, Young boy, I always go with my father hunting, and then uh, because my father is a taxidermist. Your dad used to stuff tarsi. Yes, during the time, and during the time there are a lot of tarsi around in this area. And then something changed, I guess. Yes, because of the destruction of the habitat, uh, the slash and burn farming. Sometimes when they burn, the 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 hills. Sometimes they also born also. They trapped by fire. So they're trapped mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're burnt alive. Mm -hmm. By year it is, it's difficult to find even a single one. So that's why I decided to stop. And I told my father to stop hunting. And, and what did your father say? <laughs> first time, he got angry at me. <laughs> because that's our uh, means of livelihood. It seems incredible to me that an extraordinary little creature like the Tarsia could be almost pushed into extinction in this country because of deforestation. There are a few projects like this one set up to protect the Tarsia, but for the original forest on which it depended, it's too late now. There's nothing that can be done to protect that. It's already gone. more than 7,000 islands in the Philippines and it's always been hard for the politicians in Manila to project their power across all of them. Just to the south of here is Mindanao, the largest of the islands in the Philippines and it's one the government has found particularly difficult to control.
more than 7,000 islands in the Philippines. And it's always been hard for the politicians in Manila to project their power across all of them. Just to the south of here is Mindanao, the largest of the islands in the Philippines. And it's one the government has found particularly difficult to control. Katia Adler has been to Mindanao, an island that's more conflict zone than holiday destination. Mindanao is different from the rest of the Philippines. Many people here are Muslim. Over the years, ethnic and religious tensions, as well as historical land disputes, have frequently erupted into armed conflict. Currently, the south of the island looks like a war zone. Westerners have been kidnapped here. Muslim insurgents are fighting for an independent homeland. The Filipino army has a big presence in Mindanao. It's trying to keep control of the island. The sense of grievance here runs deep. To find out more, I went to a Muslim school to meet the head teacher. Assalamu alaikum. Mrs. Abu Bakar teaches her students the history of their homeland, which they call Bangsamoro. The lesson I prepare for you is the Bangsamoro nation centuries older than the Philippines. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. The Muslims of Mindanao say they weren't conquered by the Spanish in the 16th century, so many believe they shouldn't be part of the Philippines. People like Mrs. Abu Bakar want to belong to an independent Islamic sultanate. And therefore, we have the right to claim independence because we are still Muslim up to now. If we are not For many Muslims, autonomy is simply not enough. How do you solve the problem? Yes. Start the war. Okay. What else? Yes? Return the Mangsamoro independence. So what I'm saying is, this land belongs to the Mangsamoro people. When you talk to them about the conflict, do you mention the rebel groups who do use violence? They know. Even we don't teach them, they know, they are informed. They know what is going on. Even they are young, they know. They know. They know the story. because. Uh, their neighbors, their relatives, their fathers are Mujahideen. Mujahideen are fighters. But, but I do not recommend fighting. I don't recommend war. Many of these students also have friends and relatives made homeless by the fighting. They prepare relief packages of food and clothes for the refugees. To deliver these packages to the makeshift camps means driving through the war zone. here has been tightly controlled as the food bags have been handed out. We've been locked into a gate with a, a few hundred people because from the small school that we've come from we've only had a few hundred bags. But on the other side of that gate are thousands more people, thousands more Muslims who have lost their homes, they're hungry and they're desperate. Because of the cost of war, the suffering that we see all around us, would you be willing to say, okay, we won't have independence in order to have peace? Would you give that up? I don't think so. It's, personally, I don't think I can do that because I don't trust this, uh, the, the, the maker of this situation. I don't trust um, You mean the Philippine government? Yeah, right. The Muslims will sustain here. This land belongs to us. And we live here. We live in Mindanao. This is our home. This is our home.
As in so many conflicts around the world, this island has been ripped apart by land disputes and religious tensions. Over the years, attitudes have hardened. People have reached for guns. Here, even those who say they value peace, like Mrs. Abu Bakr, prize victory over compromise. If there is to be peace in Mindanao, there'll have to be an outbreak of trust on all sides.